Beijing is pursuing unification on a much faster timeline than previously thought. Dozens of Chinese warplanes and ships cross the unofficial boundary in the Taiwan. It's one of the most consequential questions of our time. Is China going to invade this island here, Taiwan? Ultimately, it comes down to one thing. What is the plan in this guy's head, Xi Jinping, the Chinese Premier? So how do you get to know what somebody thinks? You can look at what they've said and they've done individually. That's tricky in this case because we don't know a huge amount about Xi Jinping. Another is to look at the culture that shaped them. And particularly this, people through history got China wrong. And to be fair, China got the West wrong as well. The question is why? In this video, we're going to look at lessons from Chinese history that shed light on the question of whether China will invade Taiwan. In 1792, Britain had a problem. It was importing lots of highly valued goods from China, in particular tea. May I offer you some tea? Thank you. But China wasn't buying anything from Britain. Not only that, it only wanted payment in silver, hard currency, in other words. Not hugely convenient. Britain had been involved in a costly war with the pesky Americans. Yeah, you know who you are. And it had been cut off from its former access to the silver mines of South America. It really made sense to get more equal trade going on. Lord George McCartney was identified as the man for the job. McCartney was a skilled diplomat, highly experienced on the world stage, the best that Britain could have sent. In spite of Britain's growing strength as a world power, he was told to treat with China as an absolute equal, which was seen as remarkable generosity to a non-Western power. And this was in no sense a trivial mission. McCartney left Portsmouth, England in 1792, sailed down the west coast of Africa, was pushed off course on the way by the trade wind, so he stopped at Rio de Janeiro. Then from there he went to what is now Cape Town, South Africa, from there stopping at Jakarta, finally on to Macau, China in June 1792. He then took a couple of months to arrive at the court of the emperor, arriving in August. It took him about a year. But he was there to present the most generous and fair offer that Britain had made to any nation in that period. Now you could take that as damning with faint praise and there were certain aspects of a proposition that were pushy to be fair. But then these things are subject for negotiations. And then imagine you were Lord McCartney. You had done your preparation, you knew how to do this, you were at the top of your game and you were representing one of the world's great powers. You must have had moments like that, times when you walked in the room thinking, yeah, I got this. And that's where it all went horribly wrong. Britain and China just saw the world completely differently. Where you stand affects what you see. For the nations of the West, they'd emerged over the centuries as political forces of roughly equal strength. Diplomacy therefore became defined as managing the delicate balance of power. That wasn't remotely the world that China was in. For centuries, China had been the most advanced nation on the planet. It had never had exposure to a country that could even come close. All visitors were mere barbarians in comparison. Literally, they called them barbarians. They called us barbarians. I mean, they kind of had a point, but you know, it's just rude. Not only that, but unlike some we could mention, China was not trying to build an empire. Ambitious leaders wanted the borders to be at their historical maximum, for sure, but that was it. There was no new world to colonise. As far as they were concerned, the promised land was China. They were already there, so why go anywhere else? So yeah, that British thing about treating the Chinese as an absolute equal, what was intended as a compliment was actually interpreted as a massive insult. How dare the British 
believe themselves to be an equal. When he met the Emperor, McCartney showed him all the things he brought, artillery pieces, a chariot, diamonds, studied wristwatches, British porcelain and portraits of the King and Queen painted by Joshua Reynolds, the cream of British art and British invention. Surely at that point, he thought, the Chinese would see how they'd been left behind, would want to embrace trade as a method of catching up. Yeah, not so much. The emperor was used to barbarians coming to the court in order to pay tribute, which is how those gifts were interpreted. When McCartney tried again to get his host to understand Britain's proposition, and when the emperor's translators had translated the documents fully for the emperor to be able to read for himself, well, then he was sent away with a flea in his ear, or specifically with the most stinging rebuke of a letter addressed to his king. And it can be summarised like this. It's nice that you recognise our superiority, but this trade thing, it's just a joke. We have everything. You have nothing that we could ever want. Thanks, but no thanks. Life lesson. Be careful who you insult. On his way out the door, McCartney took careful note of what the Chinese had in way of military, and the answer was not very much. A couple of English frigates would be an overmatch for the whole naval force of their empire, he reported back home. Now, apparently the empire was very aware of the potential consequences of what he'd just done, and he wrote to his own people, England is stronger and fiercer than the other countries in the Western Ocean. Since things have not gone according to their wishes, it may cause them to stir up trouble. Well, he wasn't wrong. Eventually, Britain came back in force, and that was the start of what is now taught in China as the Century of Humiliation a series of forced unequal treaties imposed by military. But here's the thing, the Chinese elites were still utterly convinced that they had nothing to learn. They'd had setbacks before, sometimes the barbarians had invaded China or threatened to do so. The Chinese way was to manage them, play the tribes off against each other. And if they did invade, well, give way, but work tenaciously over time to rebuild relative advantage so you could reclaim the lost ground. War was the last resort, the Chinese played the long game, and the long game always favoured the Chinese. At least, it always used to, up until this point. Now, occasionally Mandarins would argue that, no, this time was different. It was time they picked up the barbarians' ways, assimilated their technology so they could fight back on their own terms. But largely those mandarins were ignored. The humiliations continued. Fast forward a hundred years. Everything changed when Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party gained decisive victories in the Civil War. The old nationalist regime of Chiang Kai-shek was forced to retreat to the island of Taiwan. Everyone agreed that Taiwan was a part of China. Mao said that he ruled the whole of China, including Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek said that he ruled the whole of China, but was temporarily in exile just in Taiwan. Mao's desire to secure Taiwan at that stage was just mopping up from the revolution, and he intended to do it within a year. But before he could get around to it, his North Korean communist ally decided to invade the South. A highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack unprepared South Korean defenders. Initially, Mao thought, no problem, America won't bother itself much about it, and he could ignore it and carry on. So he started to build his forces in Fujian province, ready to attack Taiwan. And then the United States sent its fleet into the Taiwan Strait. Between 35 and 40,000 men were landed behind the enemy's lines in an operation executed without a hitch. That changed everything. Suddenly it was clear that no, the US would not stand by and watch the North invade the South in Korea, nor indeed to watch Mao invade Taiwan. Once again, China and the West were seeing completely different versions of reality. America saw itself as resisting aggression in Korea, supporting universal values of the inviolability of borders. As far as Mao was concerned, the US had just carried out an invasion of Asia. 
what the West considered to be establishing deterrence, China interpreted as encirclement. Which was why China then joined the Korean War to stop the West from making Korea into a unified democratic state. Then it happened. The Chinese Red Armies, numbering hundreds of thousands, swarmed over the frontier against thinly held United Nations positions. And that disagreement about reality, it went on and on. As far as the West was concerned, you had Communist Soviet Union, this enormous bloc. You then had Communist China right next to them, and the two of them made up one cohesive whole, determined to spread communism around the world. Traditional balance of power theory. If you are a country faced with two superpowers, you will do better if you ally to one of them. And then you get their protection, and hopefully the two of you combined become more powerful than the other. Instead, Mao challenged both of his rivals simultaneously, which in conventional sense would be considered madness. But he worked out that neither side would allow the other to take over China. He even shrugged away suggestions that one of them might use nuclear weapons in the conflict. Says Mao Zedong, the atom bomb is a paper tiger. If only half of China's 700 million people survive atomic war, communism will still triumph. Not a line that's available to any democratic politician, which I'm reasonably grateful for. But it worked. Mao engineered himself as essentially a free agent beholden to no one. In time-honoured fashion, he played the barbarians against each other. How could he do anything else? Remember, China had been the centre for the civilised world for centuries. How huge a change would it have been to settle for subservient status to Russia or America? Mao's aim was simply to do what people had done in the past, which was to restore China's greatness. Part of that drive was to match the superpowers for their technology and for their ambition. So, for instance, Mao decided that he wanted to produce as much steel as his historical enemy Britain, and to do it really rather quickly, by tomorrow if possible please. But he still retained that traditional Chinese disdain for learning from others. As a result, he went into a frankly unhinged programme. He announces that a great leap forward will be made called the Great Leap Forward, where not only did he create massive famine by pushing the farmers to plant in ways guaranteed to fail, but he got everyone, including at the village level, to set up mini steel foundries. People were taken away from important, useful work in the cause of making steel, the targets for which were set so ridiculously high that, in the end, in all of those villages and towns, every utensil had to be melted down to produce what turned out, in any case, to be inferior grade and pretty useless steel. He destroyed China's system, created unbelievable suffering and poverty. But, Here's a universal truth about human beings. When faced with a broken system, sooner or later, somebody will try to fix it. The first sign came from an impoverished tiny village that was home to just a few very brave peasants. The village was Zhao Gang. The families there were suffering, as were so many others, because the collective farms established by Mao were just really not working out. So in the spring of 1978, they met in secret one night in order to sign a pact. Now, in one telling of a story, they signed it in their own blood. And they did so because they knew that there could be serious consequences if they were found out or if it otherwise went wrong. They decided that they would divide up the commune land for farming by individual households, something that cut right across Mao's philosophy people had been put to death for far less than that. But the families, as you might expect, were highly motivated, so they put everything into managing those plots. The result, before the experiment, the grain output of the village in total had been 15,000 kilograms of grain per year. In the first year of the new system, it was 90,000 kilograms, over six times as much. But it did not stay secret, and some people attacked them for their betrayal. But the local party secretary saw the results, and he decided to support them. Again, 
a rather brave thing to do. But the winds of change were about to blow through the whole country under the new leader, Deng Xiaoping. He was set on reforming the mess that Bao had left behind. The news of the experiment went higher, and to cut a long story short, within four years, the farming contract system introduced by the village was spread throughout the country. Virtually all the agricultural collectives were gone. In four years, an incredible pace of change over an enormous country. And that wasn't the only thing that changed. When he was speaking to an Australian delegation, Deng Xiaoping told them that China was only a poor country and needed to learn from the West in order to catch up. This was a message that broke with hundreds of years of Chinese tradition. Deng Xiaoping said that China needed to build its strength quietly without drawing attention to it until the time was right. Deng opened up China for business, creating special economic zones where foreign corporations could invest in and do business on special terms. It became a highly active stream of learning technology, everything that Lord McCartney could ever have dreamed of. And it brought about massive transformation. Fifty years on, the country is on the verge of taking back the mantle as the predominant world power. Although that's not guaranteed at this stage. And that brings us round back to this guy, Xi Jinping. How much is he the product of the history we've just covered? How much, like Deng and Mao in their own ways, is he ready to break certain parts of it? These are the ways that we know that Xi fits the historical Chinese world perspective. One, he sees himself as the fulfilment of Deng's mission to bide time and build strength until the time is right. Well, he believes that the time is right now. Level completed. And therefore it falls to him to make the move in bringing China to world prominence. Two, with that in mind, China builds networks and alliances across the world, but it sees itself as the anchor. These are partnerships, but they are not partnerships of equals. China is dominant. Three, at the moment there is no indication that China's embracing superpower status involves going for territories outside its border. It still sees itself as defining itself by its maximum historical own borders. That much hasn't changed. Four, Xi has said that his ambition is for Taiwan to be reabsorbed into China by 2050. So at least one indicator that the long game hasn't been abandoned. Now it doesn't of course mean that they couldn't be planning to move early if the time was right. What are the ways that he breaks with historical tradition? Well, he's completed the break that Deng started in recognising that China benefits if it learns the technology and techniques of other nations. In relation to Taiwan, this is particularly stark. Putin's misadventures in Ukraine have led the Chinese to reflect on one compelling realisation. American military forces for good or for ill, they are frequently engaged in different parts of the world. So they have both modern systems and decades of conflict experience. China's refusal to get involved in adventures across the world has meant that its military, modern and well equipped as it may be, has zero experience. It is wholly untested. So she has said that Chinese troops need to get engaged more in external situations to build that experience. That may mean taking part in international operations such as peacekeeping operations, as well as projecting power into areas where its interests are at play. So for instance, China is quite aggressively claiming domination of the South China Sea. That shows that she is aware that they are not fully ready. So if he will continue playing the Chinese long game, he will continue to build strength to develop experience until the time is right. For sure, in the meantime, they will not be admitting any weakness. They will be projecting strength externally. He will look to build relative advantage, keep building military capacity, plan that if China grows stronger and the West resolve over Taiwan grows weaker, then Taiwan will be brought peacefully into the fold because it will become self-evident there's very little choice. But wait a minute, this is the challenge of a one-person autocracy because it all really comes down to that one person's judgment. 
The fortunes of a nation can be decided on his most grievous mistakes. Rushing into Taiwan could prove to be such a mistake if it turned out he became impatient to establish his personal legacy, which is the sort of thing that people have done in the past. My guess would be against it. I think there'll be lots of aggressive posturing, but they will still be waiting to see how the balance shifts. Unless, of course, the West falls apart. If the US dissolved into civil war, which isn't entirely out of the question, then the dynamic could change. Alternatively, if momentum did build in the world community for Taiwan to declare independence, an end to the one China policy, then you could see China concluding that it had nothing to lose and everything to gain by moving early before that momentum gets too strong. In other words, we are vulnerable should anything upset this delicate, some would say precarious balance that we have right now. One that we can at least manage better if we can manage to understand how the other side is thinking, how China sees the world. If you reached it this far and you liked the video, then do remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And hit the bell icon so that you get notified for the future videos to come.